directly applies to 5G networks and what comes beyond and uh, what are the what is the future for this? This has been a lot of, has seen a lot of interest in uh, in Sweden, in Finland, and uh, in the, the Nordic countries. They see this as a a very very important milestone for for the, their technological development. So first a brief introduction, so for us what is localization? So localization is the physical location of a, a, an entity in a network, uh, mostly to be a user. So we have two types of, of location, so we have the relative position, so when you we have a position that is, well, relative to uh, another user, for instance, or some other mobile entity on the network, and then we have what's called an absolute position, when it, this is given uh, with respect to an absolute reference. So if we have an, a position in latitude and longitude, this is an absolute position because it's the reference is absolute with res respect to the surface of the Earth. And uh, if I have the, my my position with respect to a table, which could, could also be moving, then this is a, a relative position. So why do we need it? So why do do they think? And uh, we think this is an important thing for to be worked on. For so we mostly we have been using this. Nowadays, for the navigation cars, everyone has used Google Maps or some other type of uh, mapping software. <coughs> and this is especially important for ships and airplanes. So there, has been, there have been cases of airplanes which have unfortunately been shot down because they entered an airspace where they should not have been because they lost their position or they didn't know where they were. And also ships, because the, when ships are in, uh, in high seas, they, they have no visual reference to anything. So they need to know where they are based on uh, some sort of positioning technique, which uh, in the old days would be looking at the stars or something like that, and nowadays it's mostly satellite-based position. And now we have a, 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 an interest coming up, which is indoor position. So uh, GPS is not enough for us to, or it, it's not suitable for us to know where, where we are inside a, a closed environment. And this is something that uh, recently has seen a lot of interest in by big companies. So where, where am I in, the, in this big shopping mall? Or where, where is this restaurant in an airplane? Or sorry, in an, uh, in an airport. So this, is, this has seen a lot of interest in this. And we have location library services. I think everyone has used uh, some type of app which knows where you are. And based on this, it, it does something. So we have two types basically of location systems based on radio which are ground based systems so in the second world war we had these two which were basically developed for to help ships ships navigate so they didn't get lost in the sea and the, the last ground based system that was developed was the omega and that's why it's called the omega because they knew it would be the last one because gps was coming up and they knew that satellite satellite based systems at the time would be superior so for well, satellite-based systems, we have the GPS, which is the American one, Galileo, European, the GLONASS, which is Russian, operational. So fully operational, we have GPS and GLONASS right now. And also we have the Chinese Byte Beidou coming up. And uh, the Indians also have one coming up. So now to discuss some basic concepts of opposition and how do we do this with radio signals. So the first one we talk about is time of arrival. So uh, we calculate the time a, waves, a wave takes to travel from transmitter to receiver. And given that we know the propagation speed of the wave in, in whatever medium it is, so we know the propagation speed of sound on, on water, for instance. So we know if it took that much time, then the distance between transmitter and receiver is, is then easily calculated given the model of the propagation speed. So one of the limitations of it is that it requires a very precise time reference, so transmitter and receiver they need to be tightly synchronized or, or yeah, be kept with the, a very precise time reference. And it's very successful to non line of sight propagation. So if a wave is bouncing around before it's reaching the receiver, it's taking longer. And then when you calculate this basing on the time that it took to travel, you have a, a, a distance from transmitter, which is not true. So this is an example of how you could do this with time of arrival. You have your distances 
that you calculated based on time from three different uh, transmitters. With it, you have a circle around each of the transmitters which tells you that where you could be. With three transmitters, you could do what's called uh, pre-lateration. So what you basically do is find the position or this optimally you would have these three circles meeting. Most of the time, you would not have this. So what you do is a least square, uh, you solve this in a least square way where you find uh, the, the position with the smallest arrow. A uh, little bit more complex, we have the time difference of arrival. So instead of just the time a wave took from transmitter to receiver, what we do is that we transmit two signals from two different transmitters simultaneously, and then I receive signal one at time instance one, signal two at another time instance. Then I calculate the difference between the times that are received, and based on this, I know that I'm closer to a transmitter than to the other. So what, what, what happens in geometry is that instead of circles or spheres, I have hyperbolas or hyperboloids, which are mathematically uh, easier, a little bit easier to, to deal with. And uh, it alleviates a little bit the synchronization requirements because the, the receiver doesn't care about synchronization, only the transmitters need to be synchronized. And uh, also it suffers heavily from non-outside propagation due to the same things that I talked about. So here, you don't have circles, you have hyperbolas, and again, you find the po optimally the point where these three meet, and then you have the position of wh where you are in space. Uh, so thirdly, we have round trip time of arrival, which is basically the concept that we use in active radars. So you, sen you send a uh, radio signal, and you wait for it to come back. So the receiver could be a passive receiver, so let's say I s if it's a military sort of, of radar where I send a signal and I hope it bounces off a plane and it, it comes back to me and I calculate it, this is a passive one. It could also be a, an active one where I send it. The guy then do does some processing or something and it send, sends it back to me. So again, it's very similar to the time of arrival. Uh, the only thing then I need to take into account is that if it's an active receiver, I need to know what's the processing time it took. So Good thing about it is it does not, does not require time reference at all. I can keep my own time reference. Uh, however, if it's an active receiver, or, uh, we need to have the clock lift need to be kept small enough so that the, the estimation is not ruined because um, the receiver will tell me, okay, I took this many, this many clock cycles to, to process and send it back. But if his, his clock cycles take much longer, or much, much less than uh, I expect, then I have a problem. And it's sensible to variations in processing time. So this is what I'm talking about here. I send the, the signal, it takes some time to propagate, reach the receiver, it processes something, if it's an active receiver, if not, and it bounces back, right, and I have another propagation time. If I compensate for the processing time, then I can calculate and estimate the position similar to the time of arrival problem. So now we have a uh, the direction of arrival, which is a little bit of more, let's say more modern method. So what is the direction of arrival? It's the angle at which a certain wave front has arrived at an antenna ray. So the difference between this and the other methods is that with direction of arrival, we don't have hyperbolas or circles. We have lines or vectors in space. So it's not a trilateration, but it's a triangulation because we're now working with angles. So the problem is a little bit different. The good thing about it is there's no synchronization requirement because I can estimate the DOA at any time I receive a signal. Not so good thing about it is that it requires an antenna array, so this is not something I can have everywhere, so it may be hard to install an antenna array on a cell phone or, or on a mobile device or something like that. And it, it is capable of mitigating online of sight to a degree. Uh, we can separate online of sight or we can facial filter it out, but uh, it, it needs to be uh, Kept, kept reasonably within some bound. So basically this is what I'm talking about. This is the direction of arrival problem. We have an incoming wave. We consider we are far enough from the transmitter that the wave is uh, flat. We have a, a small enough array also that we can assume that this is a flat wave. And this is the angle. And then we have this vector pointing out to the transmitter somewhere in space. So this is an example. Let's say we have a, an antenna array on one of the rear view mirrors, one at the other. I calculate the, the directions of arrival here, 
And basically what I need to do is find the point where these two, two lines meet in space. So a little bit different from the other ones. And for more basic ones, we have receiving signal strength. Also a, a similar concept, let's say, to the time of arrival. Instead of using the time, I use the receive to hour. I know uh, the path loss model of whatever medium I'm working on. And with this, I know how long the wave has propagated. If, if, if it has been transmitted with a power X and received with a power Y, then I should be able to tell how long the wave has propagated. Uh, it's sens very sensitive to channel fading and changes in the environment. So the, if you are using this, the environment needs to be very well defined and the model needs to be very really good. Uh, the good thing is that it's a very simple method. It also does not require any type of synchronization. So basically what to do is you look up at your model in a lookup table. Okay, this is the power density that I have received. So this should be the propagation distance the wave has had to travel. And this is my distance from transmitter. And I go back to the, to the problem where I have to trilaterate it with the surface. And more, a more advanced version of it, let's say, is what's called the power delay profile, where we take into account not only the power, but also the delay of what, a relative delay of the waves I have received. So it requires a very large database or a very complex model. This is the bad part about it. But the good thing about it is that it benefits from the presence of non-line of sight, actually. So if, you, if it's separable non-line of sight, it's doing good for your position estimate. And it requires only one transmitter and one receiver. So basically, what happens here is that I have three, let's say, I have received three waves. So I have three different powers and delay, uh, relative delays. So I look up at my database or, or at my model, and I don't, if I receive these three waves with th their power and their relative delays, I should be here. Because if I move here, the relative delays and powers between the, the waves should be different and should hopefully be unique, as that I can tell I'm here or anywhere on the network. So now a little bit about localization in 5G networks. So, uh, Positioning 5G networks is, let's say, the first or, or, or a big opportunity to have it built from the ground up as part of the standards. Because for 3G, LTE, 4G, uh, positioning was there at some point, but it was not considered as a, let's say, as a mainstay of the of the uh, of the standard. So it was not really super important for 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 the standard to have precise positioning. And, and this could be something that we have as part of the standards itself in 5G networks, because 5G have many promising, or ha has a lot of promising technologies that should help with positioning. For one of them is dense networks, so because of the high frequencies and bandwidths, you should have more band, uh, base stations in 5G. So you should have more reference to which you could calculate your position. Uh, and you also have what's called device-to-device -device communication, so you can do uh, cooperative positioning. So if you have, if let's say, if one of, uh, one of us here in the room has an absolute position and we can calculate our relative position to, to this person, then we all have absolute positions. Uh, and one of the big technologies that is coming up and has, it's seen a lot of attention in the signal processing community and communication community, and uh, it's been looking at for 5G is what's called massive MIMO. So it has a, a lot of applications. It's spe especially interesting for uh, for serving a lot of users with the same frequency or using the same frequency better. And for us, what is special about it is that it allows us to do three-dimensional three dimensional positioning of mu a lot of users because we expect these arrays to be very big. And for, for the providers then, wh why, is it, why do they care about the position? Why is it, it's not their problem, right? But they can use this position to then employ techniques like being former, being former techniques or yeah, to serve the positions in, to serve the users in three dimensions. So what this means is that a provider can now reuse these frequencies in space uh, much more often because I can use the same frequency here and then again here because my beam is so tight that I, uh, there will supposedly be no interference. Uh, and also a good thing for us is that because of the big dimensions of the array as you expect with a name like Massive, uh, we can now assume that the wave fronts are not flat anymore. So we can take into account the spherical wave fronts, and as we will see, this will actually benefit our, our precision. So 
if we come back to the, to the problem where I showed with the cars where you had two subarrays, so if we do this in, a, let's say, a classical way and we do individual estimations at each of the arrays that were at the rear view mirrors, and we consider it a flat wavefront because the arrays are, are, so, are, are small and the distance is relatively large, then we have this performance in meters. However, if we consider that this, the two arrays are in fact one big array, which is only sparse because we, we, we don't have antennas in between the, the rear view mirrors, you can have this performance because we now have been allowed to consider the curvature of the wavefront and to do uh, joint parameter estimation. So this is one of the main benefits of uh, massive MIMO and, and of uh, antenna arrays of such dimensions. And as I talked before, one of the important things of, or one of the important factors of 5G is that they have a broadband signal at a very high frequency. So the bandwidth for us is important because a larger bandwidth results in uh, improved delay estimation because it has improved time resolution. So the higher the bandwidth, the higher the time resolution. And as we've seen before with time of arrival problems, a higher time of resolution uh, is directly related to a higher spatial resolution. So uh, you have, a, let's say, the bound for your estimation is then lower. You can go uh, more precise with, with a higher bandwidth. And the higher frequencies are beneficial for your propagation scenario because the higher frequency will reduce the probability of strong uh, non-line of sight components due to path losses and things like that. And it ar allows the arrays with to have more elements to be more tightly packed because uh, usually the, the distance between the elements, as we've seen yesterday with the, the talk from Professor Nozick is, uh, is a function of the wavelength that you are dealing with. And then you can have tighter beams because you have more elements and the array aperture has improved. So this is, uh, if, you, if, if we go back to the same problem with, with the car and the two, two subarrays, this is what we have when we compare the bandwidths. So for narrow band, we have this error uh, with respect to this distance from the source. So due to the, the nature of how triangulation works, the, the farther you are from the source, uh, the, the higher your error will be. Uh, but I if, if we go from a narrow band to a broadband 20 megahertz case, we have gain here 20 dB. So uh, this is the type of gain we're talking about here. So if you, co if you compare again in SNR instead of distance, we, we observe the same, uh, the same thing. So here is around 15 dB and how the broadband and narrowband are also capable to deal with non-line of size components is, is different. This is mostly due because when you're working with broadband, uh, because of the broadband considerations, you have more parameters to be estimated, which then make the non-line non non of size components uh, more separable from the line of size components. You can identify more non-line of size components and remove them from your estimation. So again, uh, now what, what do we benefit from, uh, from locations in 5G networks, or from, from having these in the standard for 5G networks? So the first one is we, have, we can have position-based position handoff. So instead of having handoff like today where it's based on, on signal power or cell ID, uh, you can handoff uh, to a different uh, base station based on the position the user is. And this is even more interesting when instead of looking at uh, cell phone networks, we're, we're looking now at wireless, local wireless networks. So when we are traveling or, or walking, walking in a large environment like an airport, uh, sometimes what happens is we lose connection to an access point and then it takes a lot of time for a cell phone to connect to a different access point. And then we, we, we may have, for instance, lost a, a call or something like that. And we, if we can do this based on positions, we can do this uh, and optimize this in a way that it, this now s is seamless. It, for, for the user, the connection is never lost because w you have never allowed the, the signal to, to reach such a low, low threshold that you lost connection and, and then the cell phone needs to look for a new access point and connect to it and have it stuff like that. And uh, a very important thing that's coming up now, it was called proof of location. So. This, is, this has come, 
it's it, it has seen a lot of talk in, in many different fields, but one of the fields is, for instance, uh, uh, cognitive networks. So let's say I'm, I'm in a place and I'm, I'm asking for the provider, okay, I'm a secondary user, I would like to know uh, if I can, can use this, this frequency here. And then the, the provider say, okay, use it, but I'm not actually there. So what I'm doing is I'm performing a sort of denial of service attack just by requesting frequencies somewhere I'm not. So with 5G networks uh, or with systems where you can have locations proved by the, by the provider, now you can check, okay, this guy's actually here, I can give him this network to use as a secondary user. Or, okay, this guy's not here, so no, you cannot have this network, uh, this frequency. I'm sorry. And with, for the, we can have now what's called location-based pricing, so let's say you make a deal with your provider and you say, uh, if, if I'm within 100 meters of my, of my house, my calls will cost less, and, or, or the inverse. So this, this could be also something beneficial. And as I've talked before, you have what's called improved bridge resource management because you know where the user is in space, so you can have a better planning of how to uh, of how to divide your resource blocks or your frequencies, your channels. Uh, however, you can do this now in space in three dimensions. So, what's coming up in the future for localization? Also, so. Uh, in, in Sweden, in the Nordic countries, they have a lot of interest in, in vehicular networks, vehicular ad hoc networks for applications such as road safety, traffic control, and platooning. When platooning is when you have a one driver driving a truck, for instance, and then you have 20 trucks behind him, <coughs> following him, following him auto automatically without a driver. So the common thing uh, among all these applications is that they require all the vehicles on the network to be localized with a very precise accuracy because you don't want 20-ton uh, trucks that are driving 100 kilometers per hour to not know where they are because this, this could be very dangerous. And we also have, uh, on the same context, uh, as I talked before and all those, uh, on the context of vehicular networks, you have a problem uh, about spoofing, which is a user telling you that he's somewhere where he's not. <coughs> so let's say, on this context, we have uh, these trucks driving really fast, and then I have an adversary coming on my network, and then he's telling me that he's somewhere where he's not. So what he, he can do is then he can make one of the trucks have to brake hard enough so that the trucks that are behind him cannot brake in time. So he can lead to crashes, or he can lead to trucks having to overspeed because they are trying to avoid an obstacle which is not there, or underspeed. And this is a very serious problem because this is a life-threatening scenario. So you have people in, in these vehicles or you have people around the roads and you don't want this to happen. Uh, and also, nodes can send just simply send malicious or fake timestamps. If you are working with a time of arrival, he can say, yeah, yeah I, sen I sent you this package at this time, so y my position is this, but he, he did not. He sent it later or he, or he sent it earlier, he just timestamped it in a fake way. So there, there have been some position verification approaches such as consensus. Uh, and it, they can mitigate, but they can also not truly solve the problem in a way that we, we can reliably now use the systems. And, uh, and then we come, what is a possible solution? Then to, to derive, as we talked before, the position from uh, the physical parameters of the, of the physical layer, or for the parameters from the physical layer, because it, it would take a much more advanced adversary and transmitter to fake this and, and be able to fake uh, directions of arrival at each of the subarrays in a way that he plans uh, that he plans a fake position then it takes for you to simply fake a GPS position or to fake a timestamp so this is what we've been looking at right now in, uh, in and has seen a lot of interest in Sweden so what are some future applications of this uh, and uh, what we will see maybe happening in the future so uh, physical social network. So you arrive at a party and you look at Facebook and Facebook says, hey, th y these friends of yours are here right now. So you can choose whether you want to stay at the party or maybe leave. And uh, physical browsing and digit digital shopping. So you go to a place, let's say you want to buy a fridge, but you probably don't want to carry the fridge home. So you go to the store, you look at the fridges and uh, say, okay, I want to buy this fridge. So 
you go to the internet and then you need to look up what is the model of the fridge and then you need to buy it. So instead of this, you just stand in front of the fridge, you access the app and you say, I want the fridge which is in front of me. And then they know where you are in space. And they say, okay, we have it delivered to your home. You can have also location-based deals. So this is for the marketing people, they can go crazy with, okay, if you are here in between two and four, then you can prove it. We will give you a discount on this or in that. Uh, you can have what reality tagging or people tagging. So instead of taking a picture and and, uh, and Google telling you, okay, this picture was taken in in Azazu in Brasilia, it's now telling you, okay, this was taken in in the room number one two five in UNB, and so uh, this uh, may be interesting. So as I, we talked about, you, we c if if we go further. If we make ac uh, the accuracy enough and the system reliable enough, we can have platooning and self-driving vehicles. So I think everyone has seen that Google has an interest on it. They've been working on it. And this is, uh, at least from our perspective back in Sweden, this is the future. So this would solve a lot of problems instead of taking t 45 minutes to drive somewhere because you have traffic jams. If you leave it in the hands of a computer, you can take 20. Uh, and you can have accurate indoor localization, which is something we, you don't have right now. So you can go to a shopping mall that you don't know, and you say, okay, I would like to, to go to McDonald's. And where is McDonald's? Okay, it's on the third floor uh, at this place, and you are on the second floor at this place. So take this, so navigate like this, and you should read where you wanna be. So this is, right now, this is impossible. We cannot do this in, in indoor systems or, or indoor localization methods are not precise enough even to tell us in which floor we are. So this, this is <coughs> what we expect to be a disruptive technology. So when indoor localization is precise enough, we expect to have technology which would, will, which will change how we uh, deal with, with these things very rapidly. Uh, as I talked about before, we also expect cooperative positioning, so users to position be in between themselves and uh, data fusion so the fusion of different sensors has seen a lot of interest in in recent years so when I was still at uh, at the German space agency Google Google hired an entire department which was dealing with data fusion for a lot of money and made me regret that I was not dealing with data fusion so this is something which a lot of Big companies are very interested in. So, uh, to conclude, so we are I even if we, if we we don't realize right now, location of our services are are a part of our day-to-day -day life. So we use Google Maps. Many people checking <coughs> with Facebook or something, and uh, we have a lot of mobile apps which already want to know where we are, so they work in a certain way. And uh, the nominal accuracy of the current method is unfortunately not sufficient for a lot of these applications. So GPS, the, the nominal accuracy of GPS is 50 meters. So this is, this is not enough for indoor positioning for in, in even for, for self-driving vehicles. So 5G is the perfect opportunity for the location systems to really move on to the next generation or to have this, uh, this, this jump in, in precision and, and, and in reliability. And this and the problem of localization has re finally recently seen uh, large interest, in, as I said, from big companies in uh, accurate indoor position to drive innovation in this area. So thank you very much. Thank you, but, uh, uh, thank you, Marco. Uh, I would like to open the room for questions. Please, Ivanilson, please go ahead. Good presentation, congratulations. Uh, I'd like to know if you know, uh, if you're aware of a uh, um, um, startup from Recife called In Local Media, uh, that they have uh, an indoor location technology that was nominated the, the most accurate technology in the global market by the IEEE, ACM, and uh, Microsoft in 2014. No, I have not. Heard yeah, of they, they are. Uh, a uh, startup based on Recife that, that it was formed by uh, four computer scientists, actually four students uh, uh, in computer science uh, from 
Universidade Federal de Pernambuco. Uh, they are no longer a startup now. They, they, they have 180 uh, employees and, and their uh, revenues will be close to 200 million reais this year. And they, they have a very interesting uh, indoor uh, location technology. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a good uh, point for you to, to know. And a second quick question. Uh, I'd like to hear from you uh, comments about the pros and cons of 5G versus dedicated short-range communication for future vehicles. Yeah, the dedicated short-wave, especially ultra-wideband, we ex expect it to be more precise. But then the problem is that uh, you, you need to s develop a separate standard, let's say, for, for dedicated short-wave. And uh, uh, people in the, in, in the automotive industry, they they really don't, at, at least the people we talked with Volvo and, and other, they don't like to have, uh, let's say, uh, they, they have no interest in have a separate system only to, to do this. So they don't want to work on a, on a separate uh, standard because then you, you would need a standard just for this, or separate for, for, uh, for vehicles. And, uh, and, and we, we, if we're working with short wave of, especially ultra wideband, then you're working with a, with a time of arrival sort of problem. So uh, it's still a little bit susceptible to, to the problems of synchronization, so you need to solve the synchronization, which you, you can solve if you use GPS, for instance. Uh, but it's, it's you still need, let's say, a layer, which would be uh, a, a safety layer or, or to cross-check the positions that you're receiving uh, to make them reliable enough in a sense of of not having an adversary trying to mess up with uh, your with your network. Uh, we have one more question, Professor Nosek. Um, I think I can speak loud enough. Uh, I think there are two perspectives for the localization thing. One is uh, one is uh, that I, as a user with my smartphone, know where I am with some of these procedures, and the other one is the network knows where I am. I don't like that the network knows where I am. I'm, I'm fine that in, there are situations where I appreciate to have a precise localization. Are there any provisions uh, being thought of in the standard to, to keep these things so that the user can decide whether he would like that the network knows or not? Or is the only possibility that I switch off my device? Yeah, right now the, the only possibility that you unfortunately have to switch off the device. But well, the problem is I don't never know when it's switched off because I, if with the new devices I can't take out the battery. Yeah. And that's the only way to really make it bad. Yeah, that's very true. Very scary. Yeah, it's scary, yeah. Thank you, Marco.